Coming up on The Watchmen, it is day 13 of Israel's war with Hamas terrorists in Gaza, and Amir Sarfati of Behold Israel is here with a breaking Bible prophecy update. That's next. Welcome to The Watchmen, day 13 of the Israel-Hamas war. And before we go to our good friend Amir Sarfati of Behold Israel, here is a quick overview of the state of play right now on the ground in Israel and Gaza. Number one, we are still awaiting that coming Israeli ground invasion of Gaza. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said today that the invasion of Gaza is imminent. He was down around the Israel-Gaza border encouraging IDF troops who are ready and poised to go in and to crush Hamas decisively once and for all. Number two, we've got the Gaza front, but remember, folks, we are very closely watching the northern front as well, and fire continues between Israel and Iran-backed Hezbollah terrorists to the north as well. Hezbollah continues to fire anti-tank missiles into northern Israel. We've got sirens going off now simultaneously, not only in the Israeli communities around the Gaza Strip, but also in the communities in northern Israel as well, beautiful communities like Kiryat Shimona, where I've spent a good deal of time. And the big question is, and we'll get into this with Amir, is how long can Israel hold off from responding very forcefully against Hezbollah as well, and is the Biden administration restraining Israel on that front? Another number to consider right now in the West Bank. On the Watchmen, we call it Judea and Samaria because that's what the Bible calls it. It is the biblical heartland. The world knows it as the West Bank. Nevertheless, right now, as of now, Isra Israeli security forces have arrested at least 500 Hamas-linked operatives in the West Bank as well as violence is starting to rise there. And this is no surprise. If you watch this show on a regular basis, you know that the Iranian regime over the past several months has been trying to stir things up in Judea and Samaria and create another front there as well. Another number to consider, a tragic number, some 300,000 Israelis have now been displaced by the fighting, not only in the communities around southern Israel, but as we mentioned, in northern Israel as well, near the Lebanon border. Remember, folks, some 28 Israeli communities in northern Israel have been evacuated. And look, a major war with Hezbollah hasn't even begun yet, but this is certainly a precautionary measure by the Israel Defense Forces. And then we have the aftermath of yesterday's visit by President Biden to Israel. Now, he dubbed this as a solidarity visit uh, to Israel, and it came in the wake of the controversy over the bombing of this hospital in Gaza City. Now, the world and Hamas howled and piled on Israel and unjustly and incorrectly accused Israel of bombing this hospital, as we shared on yesterday's Watchman Newscast live stream. That was anything but the case. It was a misfired Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket which caused the explosion at this hospital and killed reportedly some 500 people. But that doesn't seem to matter very much to the world because the world, and I'm talking about in particular the Muslim street in places like Turkey, Jordan, Iraq, Yemen, and beyond, continues to howl and gnash its teeth and blame Israel for the bombing, although Video, still images, and audio captured by Hamas members prove that Israel had nothing whatsoever to do with this bombing. And that also hasn't stopped the madness on American college campuses, the pro-Hamas, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic venom. We'll address that later in the show as well. But up first, before we get to Amir, I want to go to a quick soundbite, two soundbites from President Biden first, and then Prime Minister Netanyahu second, after their meeting yesterday and the Biden administration's plans to supply Palestinians with $100 million in aid. Do you think this is a good idea? Take a look. Today, I'm also announcing 
$100 million in new U.S. funding for humanitarian assistance in both Gaza and the West Bank. This money will support more than 1 million displaced and conflict-affected Palestinians, including emergency needs in Gaza. Folks, here's the problem with that. Any money, any aid, any supplies that go into Gaza must first go through Hamas, which means Hamas will very likely commandeer that $100 million worth of aid supplies going into Gaza. And by the way, earlier this week, the UN confirmed that Hamas had essentially seized UN aid that was going into Gaza as well. This is the MO of Hamas, folks. This is how it goes in Gaza. Hamas rules the Gaza Strip with an iron fist for now, but not much longer. In the meantime, Prime Minister Netanyahu gets, needless to say, how this all works. Here's what he said about this aid plan. אנחנו דורשים ביקורים של נציגי הצלב האדום אצל חטופינו. שלישית, לא נאפשר סיוע הומניטרי של מזון ותרופות משטחנו לרצועת עזה. No aid through Israel, and why would he? Why would Prime Minister Netanyahu allow that when rockets continue to fall on Israel right now from Gaza, and oh, while at least, probably more, 200 Israeli civilians, the w women, children, the elderly, are still held in the clutches who've been dragged to the bowels of hell in tunnels beneath Gaza right now as the hostage crisis continues. So no, there should certainly be no aid flowing from, Ga uh, from Israel uh, into Gaza. Joining us now, and by the way, prophetic implication to all of this, we'd love to get your comments here on the channel. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you get alerts every time a new video is posted. But leave your comments here. We'd love to hear what you think. And right now, we are joined by our good friend, the one and only Amir Sarfati coming to us from Israel. Folks, if you have not subscribed to the Behold Israel YouTube channel, do so right now and also follow Amir every day on Telegram. You are getting the best updates you will get anywhere on his Telegram channel. Amir, always great to see you, my friend. I wish it was under better circumstances. First thing, how are you doing? How is your family doing right now? Thank you, Eric. It's always good to be with you. Uh, I'm doing very well, uh, you know, concerning uh, uh, under these circumstances. I wish it wasn't so, um, but um, I've got a daughter in the military, that, uh, and then of course the rest of the family is back home. And uh, we live the war through the proximity of our house to the northernmost air base of Israel. So 24-7, the takeoffs and landings of the F-16s. And of course, we did have our share of sirens, of air raid sirens, first from rockets from Gaza that came all the way towards Haifa, and others from a false alarm of some penetration of some drones from Lebanon. So. We feel the war, but thankfully it's not as bad as the northern border or the southern one. Yes, and you know, you've been every day on your Telegram channel, Amir, and YouTube, and Twitter, and beyond. You've been giving breaking updates for everyone. I read one of your updates the other day, very interesting analysis. You said that you believe, and look, Iran has this ring of fire of proxies that surround Israel on all sides, but you believe that Hamas may have acted ahead of schedule. The grand plan for the mullahs in Tehran was to have all the proxies act at once and overwhelm Israel. Did Hamas get ahead of schedule on October 7th? As lethal as it was, it could have been worse. Absolutely. Uh, you know, six months ago, it was the beginning of April that I uh, posted on Telegram and also I think it was on Facebook as well, um, an article that was written by one of the professors uh, in Israel Bar Ilan University, who is a, a, an expert for Islam and the Arab world. He talked to one of his sources who, who lives in London, but he has connections with Iran and Iraq. And what he was told then is that the grand plan of the Ayatollahs is that there is going to be a simultaneous attack 
from the north, from the northeast, from the south on the side of Gaza, and from Yemen, from the side of the Red Sea. All of that simultaneously, first with drones and rockets, then with ground invasion, um, Israeli uh, border settlements will be taken over, uh, people will be captured as hostages, kidnapped into enemy's territory, and it'll take Israel days to recover, and by then, maybe um, those Muslim enemies will be able to take over. That was the plan. And the Iranians train Hamas, they fund Hamas, but they are not sitting there with them every day on every detail. I think Hamas saw an opportunity with that uh, music festival and with the fact that this is the last day of a festival, it was a Sabbath, and they thought, why don't we do it? Why don't we take the glory to ourselves? And we at least can feel that we did our share in this grand plan. But what they actually did is, now they're causing Israel to completely annihilate Hamas, and Israel is on its highest alert on all of the rest of the borders. So in a way, things could have been 10 times worse if the original plot would have been executed. Amir, I, I shudder to think what may have been, as horrible as this was, the deadliest day for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Uh, you talked about the threats to the north and the northeast. I'm thinking Lebanon, I'm thinking Syria, the Iranian regime and Hezbollah. The talk right now and everyone's eyes are kind of focused on the northern front. Do you see this becoming eventually a multi-front war, in particular if Israel is ready to deal that decisive existential blow against Hamas in Gaza? Well, I'll give you a little secret. Um, the first hour of the war, Israel actually thought that the whole the whole thing in the in the Gaza border is a distraction for the major thing that is about to start in the north. So most of our elite units were actually mobilized to the north. And then when we realized there's nothing in the north, they were transferred immediately down south. But you need to understand that that's our major concern. If Hamas has, I don't know, 16,000 rockets, Hezbollah has quarter million rockets, 250,000 rockets. If Hamas has a, the Nukba uh, elite forces of, I don't know, 2,000 people, the, um, the Al-Radwan Radwan forces, the elite forces of Hezbollah, are five to 10 times bigger. But most importantly, Hezbollah has many drones and precise weapon which is those rockets that can hit the target precisely, and they're not dumb ones. And that's what Israel is fearing. So um, there's no doubt that uh, we look at Hezbollah as the major threat. And as long as we fight in Gaza, we prefer not to engage in war with Hezbollah. But make no mistake, both Hezbollah in the north, uh, in Lebanon, and by the way, it's not only Hezbollah, there's Hamas in Lebanon as well, and today at least 20 rockets were fired by Hamas in Lebanon, and Hezbollah kind of allowed them to do that. Because uh, quite a few Palestinians live yeah. in refugee camps in Lebanon. But wo what we also have Amir, is the Iranian point, yeah. proxies. Yeah, there's, there's the Iranian uh, proxies in Syria. 17 different organizations are um, in Syria, of which uh, most of them are funded and trained by Iran. What happens is Iran is smuggling weapon and people through the Iraqi-Syrian border. They first settle in the city of Al-Bukamal and Al-Mayadeen on the border. And of the last, at least of the last um, few weeks, two weeks, we see a mobilization of many of them, thousands of them, towards the Damascus area. So they will be closer to our border, waiting for the day uh, of, of uh, battle to invade. If you are just joining us, folks, we are being joined right now by our good friend, Amir Sarfati, coming to us from Israel, founder and president of Behold Israel. Amir, you can, you and I can talk about this from a secular analysis perspective all day long, but the thing that sets you apart is your biblical perspective, your prophetic perspective. You mentioned Damascus. I think of Isaiah 17, number one, which talks about a day when Damascus will be no more. 
As you scan this conflict right now and the way the chess pieces are moving on the board, do you see some pretty serious prophetic implications here? Well, I do. Uh, I, I think that uh, in, right before the major Ezekiel war that everybody is talking about, the Gog and Magog war, we have to understand two things before that must happen. One is the fall of Damascus, and two is the demise or the stepping down of America from being world superpower, because America is not mentioned as, any, or no one is mentioned as someone who comes to help Israel during that war. And by the way, America is on the ground and in the sea and in the air right now um, helping Israel. So this is definitely not that Ezekiel war. But regarding Damascus, it's very interesting. At the very beginning of this war, Israel sent a very, very clear message to Hezbollah that if they will start from the north, and the message was actually to the Iranians, if they will start in the north, we will topple Bashar al-Assad in Damascus, which tells you exactly that Damascus is, uh, was put on notice right now. So yes, uh, we are on the road towards that big war, but again, certain things must happen, and we're definitely not looking at um, a peaceful Middle East in, in the near future. Yeah, what are your thoughts? And it seems like the groundwork for that Ezekiel war could be being planted right now, Amir. What are your thoughts on the world reaction? At first, there seemed to be sympathy for Israel in the wake of October 7th. Now we see the likes of China and Russia, Russia in particular, not only not condemning Hamas, but seeming to condemn Israel. What are your thoughts on how world opinion is turning? Really no surprise, I guess, prophetically, right? No surprise at all. I think that if you all believe in Bible prophecy and you see the uh, the eve of the Ezekiel war, it's Russia that is going to lead the invasion into Israel. For Russia to lead an invasion into Israel, Russia needs to stand against Israel. Uh, and, and we are watching the buildup of that animosity between us and the Russians right now. I, I, I think a few days ago I wrote on Telegram that I think Israel just signed the divorce papers with the Russians right now. In fact, there are some rumors that Zelensky will come to visit us next week. So that, you can imagine, will not be uh, something that the Russians uh, feel uh, good about. But uh, we, we are very cautious when it comes to the northern border because we understand that there is a lot of elements there that at, the, at this point we prefer not to uh, trigger because you know, we don't want Hamas to get away with what they did. And once you start something else somewhere else, you let them off the hook. So right now, the Israelis are very, very focused on getting those Nazis to pay the price for what they did, that genocide that they performed on October 7th, unlike anything we've ever seen in our history, I think. Um, that has to first be dealt with in order for the Israelis to get back and live back in the western part of the Negev. But um, no one in Israel thinks that it's going to stop right there because no one in those 28 settlements that you mentioned will ever go back home knowing that the danger is still beyond that border and they are planning something very identical to what Hamas did. So... Israel is up for very, very, very challenging uh, months ahead of us. And uh, I think we're ready for that. But uh, it's not going to be easy. And uh, it's going to be uh, having a lot of bumps along the way. Russia is not in the position right now to, you know, to attack or to do anything because it's very much in deep in the mud of Ukraine and in other places, any, even in Syria. But um, this is the beginning of the complete separation between Israel and Russia. And of course, Iran was not on our side for the last 30 years anyway. And we are watching tectonic movement in the entire world. And Israel is in the center right now. Certainly a collision course, Amir, between Russia and Israel, as you said. And thankfully, you are on the front lines keeping track of it, making sense of it all for us. Amir, we can't thank you enough for joining us. Again, folks, Behold Israel, YouTube channel, Telegram, on Twitter, now known as X, and beyond, you can find our good friend, the one and only Amir Sarfati. We are praying for you, my friend. And Amir, we will see you again soon. Thanks so much for joining us. God bless. Thank you. God bless you, Eric.
Folks, Amir Sarfati, it doesn't get any better than what Amir brings to the table. Again, check him out at Behold Israel, all over the web, YouTube, Telegram, and beyond. Hey, Amir laid out the very difficult situation facing the people of Israel right now, folks, and I did as well at the top of the show. Obviously, we know at least 1,400 Israeli, mostly civilians, were slaughtered in cold blood on October 7th. Uh, elderly, Holocaust survivors, little children, toddlers, hundreds more taking off, taken off into captivity uh, in Gaza. And we have communities in the north evacuating, 28 at last count. Some 300,000 Israelis overall have evacuated, been displaced, as I mentioned. So considering all that, many people are asking me, Eric, what can I do to help? I'm getting comments every day here on the channel. Here's one thing you can do. Our good friends at Mayor Panim are on the ground in Israel right now. It's an Israel-based organization I've worked with a great deal over the years, and they are helping to get food and medical supplies and humanitarian assistance to needy Israelis, Israelis who've been evacuated, the beleaguered communities in the south that were invaded by Hamas, where there were so many victims. Mayor Panim is there on the ground, hands on. You can help that, help Israel through helping Mayor Panim at mpgive.org. It's mpgive.org. Folks, if you watch this show on a regular basis, you know I don't partner with many organizations at all. And when I do, it means that I believe in them strongly. I've been on the ground with Mayor Panim at their soup kitchens in Israel where they are feeding Holocaust survivors and Israel's neediest, most at-risk citizens. So I can vouch for Mayor Panim 110%, mpgive.org, check it out. You're helping Israel, you're fulfilling that biblical mandate to bless Israel, and Mayor Panim is doing God's work, I can assure you of that. There are some, though, here in the United States as we continue that are doing anything but God's work and are actually standing viciously, and I do mean viciously, against God's people and God's land. You've seen the footage, folks, and we've shown it here uh, on the Watchmen over the past few days on American college campuses, for instance. Massive pro-Hamas rallies also, and this includes Ivy League folks, Harvard, Penn, etc., also in cities across the Western world, no surprise in the Arab and Muslim world, sadly, but across the Western world, places like New York City, where I'm sitting right now, Dallas, Houston, my hometown of Philadelphia, many other cities from coast to coast, also Sydney and Melbourne, Australia, London, Berlin, Germany, where a synagogue was firebombed, Germany of all places, all of this is unfolding right now. It is a demonic, I think that's the only word we can use, demonic rage uh, against Israel and the Jewish people. You know, after the ashes of the Holocaust, when American GIs uncovered the full extent of the horror when they liberated the death camps, the world was outraged and angered and disgusted with what the Nazis had perpetrated. Now, after this mini Holocaust on October 7th and 8th, much of the world seems to be celebrating what happened. As the prophet Isaiah said, we live in times where good is called evil, evil is called good. So thank God we have people like Adam Balos on the front lines in Israel advocating and getting the truth out about what's really going on, on on the ground. He's the CEO of the Israel Innovation Fund. He joins us right now from Israel. Adam, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time during this difficult time to join us. First question, and I've seen you, you're, you're on social media, you're in the media throughout advocating for Israel. What are your thoughts when you see this massive uptick of anti-Semitism, including right here in the United States, in particular on college campuses? Thank you for having me, Eric. I, I really appreciate uh, you having me to join the show. Um, as uh, you may be aware, I was an Israel advocate at the University of Arizona uh, from 2007 to 2011. And uh, one of the things that was very difficult for me was that I was quite ostracized from many people of the Jewish community because I tried to sound the alarms of what I was seeing and the organization and the radicalization of the radical revolutionary socialist left to the BDS movement and to the pro-Hamas movement. Um, I'm not surprised by any of this at all, actually. Um, I'm more disappointed that we're unprepared for it. Um, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that the Biden administration recently released a policy on anti-Semitism. And on my talk show, Wine with Adam, on the season two season finale, 
I interviewed Tom Nides, and who was the former ambassador to Israel and, and a very good friend of mine. And um, we, we had a very basic disagreement on the effectivity of or the effectiveness of that anti-Semitism policy. And that's because, one, it did not mention uh, Zionism at all. It did not mention anti-Zionism at all. It only addressed the issues of the radical right and white supremacy. It did not address the issues of radical Islam or the revolutionary left or extreme left-wing anti-Semitism. If you remember a couple of years ago when the Black Lives Matter riots happened, a lot of the reports were out saying that it wasn't actually African-Americans that were doing the rioting and the looting. It was white people. Um, and what who they were, were the radical socialist revolutionary left, who is then the backbone and the voice box of the pro-Hamas movement. Uh, a majority of them are more than likely voters for people like Bernie Sanders, um, who, who believe that America is the enemy of good. And they seem to really represent what used to be the Arab Soviet bloc in the UN uh, many years ago, um, prior to the fall of the Soviet Union. It's the same ideology. It's the same propaganda. It's, uh, it's not surprising to me at all. Uh, the fact is, is that we've been sweeping this problem under the rug for nearly 16 years, if not 20 years, if not longer. It does take time for these ideologies to crystallize on college campuses, for professors to receive tenure, to then start radicalizing their students. Um, so when it began, the, the modern Hasbara movement began, uh, the pro-Israel movement began after the Second Lebanon War. And that is when you started seeing these protests on campus. So I, I, I don't mean to sound bleak or rude or uh, to disregard any hard work by any organizations that have been done, but I very much feel everybody for the last 20 years has been very focused on inclusiveness and trying to get everybody to like Israel instead of just defending Israel for what it is and also acknowledging the fact that there was a major anti-Semitism problem brewing across the United States. It's, it's not like 1939 Germany just came out of nowhere. Okay, a lot happened between 1920 and 1938 and 1939. A lot of things have happened since 2006 to 2023. And the fact that everybody has ignored it is, is quite sad. Um, and now we're having to deal with yeah. the fact that the revolutionary left is in the streets. The anti-Semitic pro-Hamas revolutionary left. Yeah, as you just laid out, there is an unholy alliance in particular on American college campuses between the radical left and radical Islamists. We have about a minute left in that time. We want to have you back, Adam, for more. Absolutely, there's a lot to discuss. We have a minute. We, you and I could talk about this for an entire show. You are CEO of the Israel Innovation Fund. Talk about some of the ways that Israel is blessing the world. And the folks that are protesting against Israel are in direct conflict with reality on the ground and how Israel is a blessing to people around the world, including in the Arab and Muslim world and including to Palestinians. Well, if you, if you look at the last 50 years of Israel's existence, the technology that has come out of Israel to improve the quality of life of the global civilization, the modern global civilization, it's hard to dispute Israel's uh, capacity to do good. In addition to that, our ability to have cultivated the desert and make the desert bloom and also desalinate water from the Mediterranean to provide water to places like Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, uh, and not only our own country, is nothing short of miraculous. There, there's something that's very true. Israel is the beacon of the post-colonial developing world, and that is for one reason and one reason only. The philosophies of the Jewish people and the, the absolute inextricable, the, the indivisible bond between the people of Israel and the land of Israel and the capabilities of the Jewish people when they are in the land of Israel and the amount that they can accomplish for the world. And not only that, just simply being the liberal beacon of democracy from a region of darkness, I think, is probably its greatest achievement. But I feel that what we've brought to the world in terms of medical advancement, techno technological advancement, and not only that, agricultural advancement, uh, no other country has advanced the way that Israel has and advanced the world forward. You can't even use your cell phone without modern Israeli technology. It's just not possible. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I do find the BDS movement to be rather humorous and laughable. <laughs> yeah, 
Adam, Israel is a light unto the nations, as you just laid out so eloquently. eloquently. Thanks so much for joining us, my friend. Adam Balos, we will see you again soon. God bless. Stay safe. Thanks again, Adam. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Great stuff there from Adam. Cutting through the lies with truth. Imagine that. Uh, facts, as Ronald Reagan once said, are a very stubborn thing, folks. And as we close, some facts for you. Look, Christians around the world are looking to galvanize right now in support of Israel and the Jewish people. And my good friend Pesach Walicki, he's a rabbi in Israel, just released a very powerful call to action at Israel365.com. Take a look. Israel is at war. Our enemies have never been more open about their goal of destroying the Jewish people and state. Throughout the world, the atheist left and the Islamists are allied against Israel. And when we consider what they have in common, it makes perfect sense. The left and the Islamists both reject the truth of God's word in the Bible, so they must wage war on Israel. The return of the nation of Israel to the land after 2,000 years is the clearest proof of the dominion of the God of Israel over history and of the truth of God's promises in the Bible. Over and over, Scripture speaks of a time when Israel will be at war with those who seek to prevent these prophecies from being fulfilled. The Bible speaks of this happening at a time when the Jewish people have returned to the land. This is that time. But Israel will not fight this war alone. As the prophet Zechariah tells us, many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and they shall become my people. This is the only verse where people from the nations of the world are called God's people. Everywhere else in the Bible, God's people means Israel alone. Zechariah teaches us that the nations will one day join together with Israel by fighting alongside us in the war for Jerusalem and the land of Israel. This is that time. Every Christian who has ever said, I stand with Israel, must know that the war that we have all known was coming, the war the Bible speaks about, is here now. This is that time. As Israel makes progress in destroying Hamas, the media and governments will pressure Israel to back off. Israel needs the Christian world standing with us. We need you to organize mass public rallies in support of Israel to counteract the demonstrations in support of our enemies that we're seeing all over the world. We need all who believe in the truth of the God of Israel to get engaged and join the fight. To quote Mordechai, if you are silent at this time, success and salvations will come to the Jews from elsewhere, but you and your family will be lost. This is that time. Israel has been gathered from the four corners of the earth. Jerusalem is being rebuilt. And now the enemies of Israel have risen up to destroy us. If you truly believe in the Bible, ask yourself, why was I chosen to live at this moment in history? The ultimate battle is upon us today, right now. This is the call for you to join the fight for Israel and for God. This is the time. Powerful words and a powerful call to action by Rabbi Pesach Walicki. He's on the ground in Israel right now, folks. And by the way, keep him and your family, or his family, in your prayers. He has right now three children serving in the Israel Defense Forces. They have headed to the front lines. He also has a son-in-law who has headed to the front lines. That's life in Israel where everyone is invested in this, some 400,000 reservists from all walks of life, all ages, have been called up as the nation of Israel, which, reminder, is the size of the state of New Jersey, galvanizes and unites to face these existential threats for such a time as this. Continue to join me in praying Psalm 91 over the Israel Defense Forces that God gives his angels charge over them, and secondly, Genesis 14, a miraculous rescue of these hostages held captivity in Gaza. Stay in prayer. Prayer works until tomorrow's live stream. Thanks so much for joining us today. God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.